Okay, so we've returned for our, our Thursday night shirim, which is very nice, doing it every other week, trying to keep as many up as possible. Um, I want to first uh, thank my wife for donating the cheesecake um, for the shiur. I'd like to request that if people are making a bracha, they please have in mind David ben Esther Halevi, who right now is, is going through a serious need for a full shalema. And if people wish to donate uh, for the sake of the Shia, for Elu Nishmas or for Rosh Shlema, of course we're, we're open to that. People, if people, so if people want to dedicate one of the Shirim to someone who uh, needs Rafua or, or needs, uh, needs Elu Nishmat after they've passed, come and speak to me. I'm sure we can arrange it post, uh, post uh, pre. We can arrange it. So I, I named the name of this Shia Beyond Cheesecake. Um, and a intelligent person will immediately notice that Shavuot is different from the other Hagim for a variety of reasons. First of all, perhaps the most obvious of all of the reasons is that we don't really have mitzvot that we do on the other Hagim. So like, for example, on all of the other Hagim, we have the special things that come out if it, if it Tiki at Shofar, the beautiful Shofar comes out. If it's Sukkot, we build the beautiful Sukkah. If it's, uh, um, if it's Pesach, we have our beautiful Matzah. We have the Seder plates. We go through the whole, the, whole, the whole shebang of sitting down and going through the story of the Exodus together. And Shavuot doesn't even have these seven days of Cholomoed and, and, and rejoicing that we normally associate with the festival as well. So for whatever reason, the festival of Shavuot is very different. Another interesting thing about Shavuot is that if we look into our Chumashim, we don't really see much in terms of a correlation between Shavuot and the giving of the Torah. We all know that Shavuot is the giving of the Torah, and as we're going to mention, we stay up all night learning Torah, and we celebrate the fact that the Am Yisrael received the Torah. But within the context of the Chumash, that's not present. What do I mean? Let, let's take a quick little look. So if we jump to Shemot 23.16, we mention the... Um, we mention at, at the beginning of 23.14, the three foot festivals, some people call them the pilgrim festivals, the al where we're going to go up to the to Beit HaMikdash, and it mentions uh, for the seven days we'll eat matzot, and then we're going to have the festival of the harvest, a Hag HaKatsiya. And that, that Hag HaKatsiya, that is, is shown by these two loaves of the wheat, har the wheat, uh, the wheat harvest that represent the Shavuot that we know, the Hagakatsia. Very nice. We also see that the day is also called Yom HaBikurim. Another, another statement of, the, of that which is Bikur, that we've gone out and we've, we've, we've selected and we've taken up to the temple. Now obviously we don't, unfortunately at the moment, have a temple. So we cannot do these things with taking the fruits up and having the, the celebration of the harvest. So that's maybe perhaps an answer for one reason why we don't have a visible sign of matzot or have a visible sign of sukkah or something like that which comes to, to, to show us what we're doing. A little bit later, I've jumped a little bit too far, one second. In Parshat Pinchas, um, which is in the book of, of Numbers, 28, 26, around here, we see that the Yom HaKatsir, the Yom HaBikurim, as it's called here in this part of the Pasha, is associated essentially with the uh, conclusion of the Pesach festival. Having gone out of Pesach, now we have this period of time, and then at the end of a certain number of weeks, following that time, we have the Hag we have this, we have this Hag. Again, no visible mention of the giving of the Torah or anything like that that we normally celebrate with this hug. 
which kind of leads us to, uh, I mean, many questions that we that we want to understand. We want to know what is the what is the connection now between the counting of the Omer, between Hag Katsia, between the giving of the Torah. If it's not in the book, how can it be? It really takes us to our first source, which is in Talmud Pesachim, in 68b. And on this particular daf of Talmud, it tells us verbatim that this uh, feast of weeks, the feast that comes after the counting of the Oymah, of these, of these seven weeks of counting, that is the day that the Torah was given. That's its statement. And then it immediately goes into all of the other Hagim, telling us about Purim, telling us about Yom Kippur, things like that. And it sort of gives us this side note that we have a Masorah, that's the day that the Torah was given. If we move through to Masekta Megillah, we have another mentioning of the giving of the Torah, but also we have the discussion, which is also brought in the Mishnayat of Rosh Hashanah, of the different, of the different uh, um, Rosh Hashanah of the year, of the different kinds that we have. And part of that is that we have a new year for trees, and we have a, a new year for kings and all these things. And that seems to be directly connected with the Shavuot. It happens to make, it makes a, a tenuous reference to the fact that um, the, the Torah was given on this day. Um, but that seems to be it. You know, the, the real source that we, that we see is in Pesachim, which sort of underlines in its one statement that we know, just because we know, that the, the, the festival of Katsir is also the giving of the Torah. There ends up being a wonderful debate in Talmud Shabbat, actually uh, on 86b, between the uh, Chachamim and Rabbi Yossi, as to whether or not the Torah was given on the 6th or the 7th of Nisan, whether it's always given on, on Shabbat. You know, we know it was given on Shabbat and so on and so forth. There's an incredible, it's, a, it's, a, it's an amazing piece of Talmud. But it turns out that there's a bit of a maklokut uh, be between whether or not we keep it on the seventh day or on the sixth day of, uh, of, of Sivan. So now we have a question. Maybe we're not keeping Matan Torah on the right day anyway because there's a maklokut as to which day it is that it was given. And maybe that does or doesn't like coincide with Shavuot depending on the year in question. So you can see that it's not necessarily obvious, given the given the sources within the the Chumash and given the sources within the Talmud, exactly that it is, so to speak, a day of Yom Torah. And yet, everywhere around the world, in every synagogue that you go to, um, for several several hundreds hundreds of years, the the readings that we give from the Torah have been set, and lo and behold. The first day of, of uh, Shavuos comes, and what do we read? We read the incredible uh, retelling in Parshat Yitro that the Torah was given on Mount Sinai. Immediately after uh, Moses sends off his, his father, father-in-law, immediately after that we have this incredible description of, of, the, of the giving of the Torah and Hashem calling to him from the mountain, the thickness of the cloud, a really enigmatic, powerful language. And that's read in every synagogue all over the world. In Israel, where you know they don't have two days, they don't have to they don't have to swap it out. But everyone, so to speak, is reading about receiving Torah Mishinai. That was established for us much later, the actual readings from the Torah that we that correlate to the different parts of the of the year were set much later. And so they, they sort of make it an assumption that that's really what we should be connected with on Shavuot. We do, of course, mention other parts so in our readings. We do mention the, the Haga Katsir. We do mention the harvest. We do mention the fact that it's a festival of weeks. But nonetheless, the focus 
our, our prime focus is not what is obvious in the text, but actually the Masorah that we have, that it was given, um, the, the Torah was given at Mount Sinai on this day, and that's, that becomes our focus. So just want to, to recap, what are we saying? That it's, it's, it's a little bit tenuous. There's no obvious mitzvah of the day. And instead of its place, we have a variety of different customs and different things that we do to try and encapsulate the fact that the Torah was given on this day and to try and make it special and to connect with the fact that we need to have a Yom Matan Torah. We could ask the question, what about Simchat Torah? A Simchat Torah, as we all know, is a bit like a Siam on the Torah. We complete the Torah and we, we dance with the Torah and everyone celebrates the fact that we've been learning Torah all year. Same way that we need to have some kind of siyum on the Torah, we need to have a Yom Matan Torah, a day where you, where you, where you celebrate it. I, in many ways, it's a bit like an engagement in a marriage. You have to have both, right? You have to get, to, get two parties out of the situation. Why only have one? You know, why only, you, know, you know the general Jewish law, which is when in doubt, celebrate. I'm sure everybody knows this. If you look into your own lives and the lives of others, life is terrifying. It's a, a string of constant battles and insecurities. And we have great reason to be afraid. We're scared of war. We're scared of disease. We're scared of financial bankruptcy. We're scared of uh, the relationships around us falling apart. We're scared of betrayal. The Torah's mechanism of this is celebrate life. Be besimcha. Use any opportunity you can to have a siyum, to get together, to have a, a simcha chodoah, to get together as a community have meals together. The only, you can almost think of it like a bit like a battle plan. Uh, Rev Nachman writes in many places, you know, when, when you see the enormity of the situation of the world, the, the correct response isn't to hide in the corner, but to, to come out in Simcha and to celebrate and to dance and to, and to be with Simcha. The Ababa Nel write something very fascinating in terms of our conversation, which I've, I've, I've got a translation. I'm just going to read to you in English. The Torah did not specify the reason for celebrating this festival is to remember the day of the giving of the Torah, as no festival was assigned to commemorate the giving of our Torah. Because the Torah is divine, and its prophecies which are in our hands testify to themselves, and there is in truth no need to dedicate a day to remember it. The Torah is so great, this is in the translation, that you don't really need a day to commemorate the fact that it's special and it's holy and we received it, because other Rabbah, if you didn't have the Torah, you wouldn't be doing all these celebrations anyway. Right? It's, it's a bit like having a beautiful car, but you don't have the key. It's great. If you, can't, if you don't have the key, you can't drive the car. Right? For sure. Rather, the reason for the festival of Shavuot is, as we've seen, because it's the beginning of the wheat festival, the wheat harvest. There is no doubt, however, that the Torah was given on this day. And so you will, so you'll see the Yom HaTeruah, which is the, uh, the day of Rosh Hashanah, we also say is also the day of the beginning of your creation, a remembrance of the first day, which is uh, sourced in Rosh Hashanah 27a, and we know that on Rosh Hashanah, we talk about Hashem creating the world, and we say that He's King, and all these things that we do. And despite that, Hashem did not command that we should observe Rosh Hashanah as an anniversary of the creation of the world, but rather it's a Yom Adin, it's a day of judgment. And we all stand together, we hear, the, we hear the shofar, we proclaim Hashem as our King. And even though, according to the Midrash, and according to our teachings, it's, it's many things. For us, nonetheless, it's a Yom Ha'truah. It's possible for a day to have multiple applications. Just because we don't see that the, the, the Rosh Hashanah is a day of remembrance of all of creation, nonetheless it is. And for us, although we think about that, it's really a Yom Ha'truah, a day of, of blowing of the, of the shofar and connecting to, to that to that Indian of... of trying to make Hashem king and celebrating the fact that we're his subjects. And as we know, there's no nation without a king. There's no king without a nation, so to speak. And we, and Israel, we are a holy nation because we have a holy God. And that, that's a part of our, our symbiotic experience in life is the fact that we are here today is only because Hashem 
allows us to be. We know that the, according to statistics, the Jews should have been obliterated a long time ago. But nonetheless, we're here, Baruch Hashem, even in Manila, we're, we're here. So, another way perhaps to say this, and I, I don't want it to sound um, disrespectful, is that the giving of the Torah on this day is not primary. Seemingly from the sources, the, the wheat festival and the celebration of the wheat festival is the primary focus of the day. And according to our Masorah, which you wouldn't know if, unless you opened a Talmud, unless you grew up with uh, Jews, unless you grew up in a, a Jewish context, you wouldn't know that this is a day of the giving of the Torah. I hope we've established that as, a, as an Inyan. Happens to be that instead of a obvious mitzvah that we do on Shavuot, we do a variety of customs and they're not just eating cheesecake. That's why I put it just beyond, beyond cheesecake. And I'd like to show you all a, a couple of sources and discuss a couple of minhagim that are associated with Shavuot. And perhaps we can see, we can think about what they, what they mean. The one that most sticks in my mind, especially from in my community in, in England, very, very fond memories, is of course, staying up all night learning Torah. In many communities, people, mostly men, stay up all night and they learn. And in some communities, they learn Bachavruta. They sit together and they learn. In some communities, there are, there are classes. Um, and in other communities, they have a Tikkun Leo Shavuot. They have this book called the Tikkun that comes out every Shavuot, particularly in Sephardic communities, where people read a little bit of every book of the Torah, and they read a bit of Mishnah, and a bit of Talmud, and a bit of Kabbalah, and a bit of... They complete a lot of different things to get a taste for the Kol Torah Kula. To have a, it's almost a bit like you would go to a fancy restaurant, and Gordon Ramsay is the chef, only it's an Orthodox Jewish Gordon Ramsay, so he does less shouting and more, uh, more shockling. And you get to taste a little bit of all the Torah. Uh, the idea of an Orthodox uh, Gordon Ramsay also made, in my mind, was a very funny image, so, so thank you. Now, where do, where do we get this custom of staying up all night learning Torah from? Where, where does it begin? So, it seems like the earliest mention of the practice um, seems to be in the Zohar Kodesh. It's interesting that that custom is not cited in the Shulchan Aruch by Rav Yosef Karo. It's not one of the customs that he brings, and we'll, we'll, we'll get there in Mitzvah Hashem. It's not one of the things that he brings down. But by the 17th century, the Magan Avram begins to record that it's a, it's, a, it's a regularly kept custom in many places. And he says, the Zohar says that the early, early pious ones would stay awake all night on Shavuot and learn Torah. Nowadays, our custom is for most learned people to do so. Perhaps the reason is based on the fact that the Israelites slept all night long and God had to awaken them when he wanted to give them their Torah. And this is brought in the Midrash and therefore we have to make a tikkun on this. Because the Jews, so to speak, overslept and had to get the, the alarm call from Hashem to receive the Torah, we, in 2023, have to awaken ourselves to the fact that we have to mitaken that, that we pull an all-nighter for God. I don't know if anybody has ever had a test they have to pass, and out comes the coffee, and you've got to pull the all-nighter to pass the test because you were playing and you didn't study. But it, it's a similar concept. We have to make up for the fact that perhaps we, we didn't have this alacrity. And so we, we tikkun it by staying up all night. Interestingly, in the Kabbalah, staying up all night learning Torah is, is, a, is a tikkun of the Arizal. Many people use it as a tikkun for very serious sins, or particularly they also appears within the context of Brit Milah. Sometimes people stay up all night learning. Um, particularly Zohar and things like that. There's a, there's a number of customs of what people study at these times, and that right now we can't go into the difference of opinion. I would suggest that it doesn't really matter what one learns on Shavuot night. It happens to be that there is some preference perhaps to the tikkun in some communities as a custom, so to speak, that in their custom men do the, the sit and they do the, the tikkun. But if somebody's heart is drawn towards Talmud or towards Halakha or drawn towards Midrash or Musa or something like that, and they know that they're going to be able to sit and be engaged throughout the evening with, with a specific kind of Torah, then perhaps that's what they should study. I have uh, asked in our community 
men who have some experience learning, if they wouldn't mind to come forward and prepare a few words of Torah, and we could have multiple shirim going on. We could have people giving a, a, a small drosha, 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes on something. It doesn't have to be the most uh, scholarly person who went to yeshiva. We know that everybody can learn Torah, and if you can learn Torah, then certainly you can teach it. It gives an opportunity for many people to come into the Beit Midrash and, and to sit down and, and grab a book off the shelf and, and to learn. I have seen many times in the context of Kiruv, of bringing people closer to, to Torah and, and clo hopefully closer to Hashem, that when they feel that they can pick up a book and open it, they feel like different Jews. Many Jews grow up, up, up in a context where they have a language barrier, where the Hebrew is hard or the Aramaic is difficult, or because of a, a negative feeling that was inculcated during childhood or, or, or in yeshiva or in yeshiva high school, it's difficult to open a book and to sit and to learn. Part of Shavuot should be really breaking that clea and being able to celebrate the fact that we have a Torah. And I don't know, if you look around the, the bookshelves around us, we have Torah in all sorts of languages. In this, in this library alone, we have Hebrew, we have some French books, we've got a lot of English books. I don't know if we've got any books in Tagalog, but maybe we could invest in some, in some Tagalog books. But it means, ultimately, that today, if you want to learn Torah, you don't have to have this fear of the language barrier. You can sit. You can, we have the entire shas in English, twice. We have two different, two different Talmuds in English. Well, you, have to, you have to wonder what your excuse is for not learning today. Today, you can download the whole, uh, the whole Torah, every different subject matter in English, on your telephone. We, we have to find excuses why not to learn. We were a very special generation. We still manage to, to wangle out of it sometimes. But... We have to break through that and realize that really we can only call ourselves Am Yisrael if we have a special relationship with the Torah and with learning. If we're not learning Torah, then we're not fulfilling our tachlid. No matter you know, how much money we give to tzedakah and how much, if we're, if we're helping people learn Torah in, in Eretz Yisrael and all these things, unless we ourselves have the pleasure of learning Torah, we have a disconnection. And it means that someone else can't learn the Torah for us. We, don't, we, don't, we can't do that. We ourselves have to be able to have the courage and have the ability to open the books and to perform this tikkun. Interestingly, some sources, let's not get into the which ones right now, have a, have a bit of an issue with the idea of staying up all night learning Torah. Because they're worried that if you stay up all night learning Torah, then what's going to happen is that you're going to pray like this in the morning, half asleep. And so some of them say you should learn a little bit, you should, you should get some sleep and things like that. It depends when you pray. If you pray very early and you pray hanet, so if you pray slightly later, it could be that you're not going to be able to have the right concentration. And it's a big, it's a big subject, but it happens to be that there's different opinions as to whether one should stay up all night or not. It depends which community you come from. If you do stay up all night, then you can get into the halachot of how do you say the, the morning blessings and things like that. That... Ruch Hashem, for my sake, is a different shia that we don't need to go into right now. For a number of centuries, Jews have also read the Book of Ruth on Shavuot. Now, it's very interesting that they've, that they've picked the Book of Ruth. And one of the things that happens right at the end of the first chapter of Ruth is that they, it mentions that they were coming to, to Bethlehem. But the Chilat Ketzir Sarim, at the time of the beginning of the barley harvest. So another direct reference to the harvest time within the context of the Book of Ruth. But also, we know that, I'm sure we know, that one of the, the most incredible things about Ruth is that she was an amazing, amazing convert who came from a completely different society, a different culture, and nonetheless, through her lineage, we have Dovid Amalek. We know that she was an extremely Yerei Shemayim person. We know that she loved Hashem and that ultimately she, she undertook uh, to convert. And we learn a lot of ideas about conversion from Ruth. In many ways, we can think of the whole of Am Yisrael as really going through a Gior, so to speak, on, on Shavuot, re-accepting the Torah for the first time and having, and having a re exposed commitment to our Torah. Obviously, this is on a symbolic level. For that reason, many, many people, both within different sects, are makbid to go to mikvah on Shavuos morning before davening. 
that's a that's an inyan that they, they go to mikvah even if they don't go to mikvah throughout the rest of the year they're not makbid many people are makbid to go to mikvah on shavuos before before davening and part of that is is this inyan of, of sort of taking on the torah the for the first time we're receiving the torah on this day and and having that makshava that even if perhaps for whatever reason we've been lax in our learning of torah throughout the year we can restart you know, you know how you start a new page in your life? You do it. It's a secret of Teshuvah. That is, it's actually a very simplistic thing. You actually just start a new, a new page. You go to your wife or to your friend or to your boss or to your colleague or to to member of community who you, you need to make Teshuvah. You say, you know what? I want to start a new page. Whatever I've done in the past, I, I know I've messed up. And I want to start a new page, and you're going to see that I'm, I really profoundly mean what I'm saying. And I'm not going to do this action that upsets you anymore. I'm, I'm going to do what I believe, and we believe to be the right thing. And, and, and with Hashem, it works. That's what Teshuvah is. When we have a moment of vidoy pair before HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and we say, the thing that I know, and you know, I shouldn't do, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm, I'm starting a Dav Hadash today. Part of that is the understanding that every book of Talmud begins on page bet. We all have an Aleph that we're coming from. But we start again on page bet. Okay, I'm brand new page. I'm on page number two. That was That's why when you meet people who've made the Shuvah, it, it's kind of it's kind of laughable. It's, hey, didn't you used to be the guy who used to hang out at the bars and do the That's the old me. You didn't meet the new me yet? That's the old page. You gotta There's a wonderful saying that uh, sometimes I've heard a few times, you should never judge a person by the chapter you meet them in. You never know what their next chapter is going to be. Anyway. A very nice, beautiful custom is also the decision to adorn the bacon asset with greenery, with flowers. It seems that this custom has at least a macaw for several centuries. Um, the Vilna Gohan had abolished the custom of bringing trees into the Beit Knesset because he was worried that it looked like uh, another custom of some other people we know uh, who are not Jews. He was worried that it, it looked too similar. Nonetheless, by the, uh, by the 15th century, it seems that the, the established practice is well known. The Maharil talks about it. Um, and his Rebbe, the Trumathodeshen, his custom was also to put greenery on the floor. Um, it seems that the whole reason was to to honor the to honor the idea of beautifying the Beit Knesset. And there's an appellation, perhaps in the Midrash, to the fact that there were flowers still blossoming on the mountain when the Torah was given, even though it was given with fire. There's some appellation to Shira Shirim. And it happens to be one of the customs that was recorded by the Mishnah Bura um, in uh, four... And for that he mentions in in uh, Tetzali Dalit, sorry, that he mentions smelling basamim and, and spreading out beautiful beautiful scented things. So many custom many many customs in many synagogues also have the custom to bring out specifically beautiful things for smelling, so mint or lavender and things like that. I have seen that within certain synagogues this is a normative thing, particularly in in Israel. When you go to Israel, you walk into a synagogue. They have a, a, a jar of water with some beautiful herbs and things like that to smell. And the idea is that you walk into the synagogue, you can make, an, you can make a bracha, and that there's, a, there's an opportunity to make more brachot, particularly on Shabbat, when there's a lacking of, of, of brachot on Shabbat, you can make up for them by making beautiful uh, blessings on smells. Some people, um, even some Hasidim, also do this before Kiddush. You might have been to my house to see that I also do this before Kiddush. I have I have some basamim on the table. And I've seen this uh, custom by several big Hasidic Rebbe's, including the Boston Rebbe, that he does it to, to Hosif Brachot. And it seems that the general idea of having beautiful greenery in the synagogue, despite the, uh, the protests of some authorities, is a well-founded custom that you see all over the world today. I'm not sure about this putting uh, the plants on the floor of the house, that I haven't seen myself. I, I haven't seen that. But certainly having beautiful flowers in the synagogue, it, it's, a, it's a very recognizable feature of Shavuot. And some people also 
uh, would put it on top of the Bima or on top of the, the Aron. People do different things and different synagogues have different customs about it. One of the reasons brought by the Magan Avram is, as I said, uh, the second Mishnah in Rosh Hashanah, which I, which I mentioned before, is that on the, uh, the festival of, of, of weeks, we have the, the Rosh Hashanah of the festival of the fruits of trees. And for that reason, maybe having the plants and, and specifically having beautiful greenery within the synagogue is a zecha to this. And to, to having the idea of, of the fact that the trees are involved in it, it's the harvest festival, and keeping that in mind and having, and having kavana and, and that being able to be a way of remembering, reminding people of what we're dealing with and what the, what the matzav is. And getting to uh, perhaps our most well-known uh, idea, which is that we know that many people have the custom to eat dairy on Shavuot. Now, aside from the fact that I love cheesecake personally. I've had cheesecake all over the world. My family knows I have a bit of a, a leaning towards cheesecake. I don't think that's a particularly bad habit to get into. Um, it's a really interesting custom that's found all over the world. And it's found you know, in all sorts of different denominations. Let me just make sure that I've got the right, the right place for us. One second. Just one second. I was pretty sure I got it in the right place. Uh -huh. So, let's talk about this. Dairy on Shavuot, probably the most well-known um, minhag that appears according to Shavuot, uh, in terms of Shavuot. Now, I think we should sort of work backwards. First of all, not everybody is happy with this custom. There seems to be a very big makor, there's, there's an inyan to eat meat and to drink wine on the festivals itself, and that's part of the joy of the hug. I would strongly suggest that that statement, Ein simcha ele there's no joy without meat and wine, is really that there's no happiness in the world without the temple, which contains obviously wine libations and, and, and korbanot. But nonetheless, al pi halacha, we, we know that people are happy with eating meat and wine, it makes people happy, and we want people to be happy on the festivals, and therefore there's a general inyan to eat meat and to drink wine on the festivals, and of course on Shabbat itself. Someone who does not like these things, of course, or, or doesn't feel or feels ethically opposed to eating them, all these kinds of things, there's no requirement, halakhically, that people dafka eat meat and wine, unless, of course, you had a korban pesach. That's a, it's not our subject right now, how that, how that works. In the Torah, we have a wonderful verse. Let me just find it for us. One second. One second. You know, you know when you mark the page beforehand so that you can find it quickly for everybody and then you lose it, which is great. It's great when that happens. Just one second, please. What is the best cheese uh, you've ever had? Best cheesecake I've ever had? Yeah. I have to tell you that this particular cheesecake that my wife has made in front of you is not her best cheesecake. She makes one with cardamom and rose water that is shocking. But we knew that what might happen in the shear is if we brought out that cheesecake, there might be a riot and we couldn't have the shear. People would be fighting in the back over the cheesecake backwards and forwards. It's so delicious. It's kind of got like an Indian taste to it. There's always there's always there's always shivuot where we also have cheesecake. So so don't worry, we we can have a we can have more more enjoyment from it. You can bring people to Shabbat. Yeah, maybe. Yes. I'm not I'm not opposed to I'm not opposed to eating more of it. Okay. Yeah, why not? Next the next round, right? That's very good. That's very good. Okay, so that's twenty six. One second. From all over the world, Rabbi, your wife and cheesecake is the best. A hundred percent. I say that all around the world, everything that I've eaten. The definitely my wife's cheesecake is the best cheesecake. That's definitely the smart thing to say, um, and it also is true. So uh, it's only a partial verse. Sorry, the book of Bemidbar twenty-eight, twenty-six, which I'm sorry I, I had to find. 
וביום הביקורים הקרבתם מנחה חדשה לאדוני, שבותיכם מקרא קודש, יהיה לכם כל מלאכת עבודה לא תעשו. משל פיפו נוגס פסוק, in 26, on the day of the first fruits, when you offer a new meal offering to Hashem on your festival weeks, it shall be a holy convocation to you. You shall not do any laborious work. However, there's a beautiful Roshi Tevos, Min Chadasha L'Hashem B'Shechotechem, the first letters of which spell Chalav, milk. So that's a really interesting remes within the, the concept of, of Shavuot that, that's there. I've seen that in quite a few places. And also the gematria of uh, Chalav is, does anyone know the gematria of Chalav? Which is? Which, no, which the correct answer is, of course, the uh, number of days that Moshe studied on top of the mountain, which is for 40 days, is the same as the gematria of Chalav, which is another interesting remez to, to eating milk, which is brought by, by uh, different places. Interesting, in the, in the Talmud, there's different names given to Mount Sinai. There's quite a variety of different names given to the mount. And one of the names is Gavanunim. And the reason it's called Gavanunim is because it has a, an appearance a bit like cheese, like Gavina in Hebrew. So one of its names is also cheese of Mount Sinai. It's a bit of a, it's a bit, look, I would suggest that that's a bit of a tenuous link, so to speak. But nonetheless, it, it's one of the, one of the drashot that's brought as to where you can find uh, a source within the Torah. I happen to think that that, uh, that Rosh Tevot is, is a very beautiful one in, in, tw- in Numbers 28, 26. You can see it in the Rosh Tevot there. It's a, it's a beautiful one. One second, just a second. Within the context of the Shulchan Aruch and in, in the writings of the Ramah here, he says the following. He says, We have in many, in some places, many places, the custom to eat dishes of, of dairy, of cheese, um, on these kinds of milkic foods, on Yom Rishon Shavuot. And he brings the incredible I, idea of the, the idea that when we had the, uh, this brought by the Mishnah Bura, sorry, that when we first received the laws of the Torah, what does it say about Shechita and taking of the blood out and doing Malicha? And all? It's very complicated. And actually, no, normally, uh, these kinds of laws of doing Shechita are left to, to Shochtim and people who have really studied these ideas really intensely. And today, unlike in years previously, most people cannot do Shechita. And you imagine that you're, you're Am Yisrael, you've just received the Torah, and you've received all these laws about how to do Shechita and how to... to do the porging of the blood and the salting of the meat and, and the kisei adam and the covering of the blood and all sorts of other details. So because they only received the, the law at that time, the general consensus is that perhaps they should eat milk foods, which in general have less restrictions and are much simpler. When people start keeping kosher and they start you know, moving towards a more Torah-observant lifestyle, very often they start with, you know what? Having a dual kitchen is very complicated. I'm going to start with meteor milky. And I would suggest 99% of the time they start with a halavi kitchen. Especially people who are just step, dipping their feet into Judaism. They're considering conversion, things like that. They know that kosher meat is very expensive. They know that the laws regarding meat and, and which heck should buy and all these things is very complicated. And if you're on a budget or if you're living in a country like we are, where our access to meat is limited by by what we have at the synagogue, then it makes sense to have more Chalavi utensils than to have a more Chalavi lifestyle than a Basri lifestyle. By the way, in my house, it's the same. Even We live we live in the synagogue, but nonetheless, you know, we, we were so used to living, doing different shlichuts where meat was less available than if you're in London or New York or in Jerusalem. So what do you do? You, you compensate by, by having more Chalavi dishes. By the way, nothing wrong. Um, as you can see from the cheesecake, I'm really not missing out. That's for sure. My wife is an incredible cook. There seems to be, and it's brought also um, in the in the Mishnah Bura here, that there's also a custom to eat honey on Shavuot. It seems to be that uh, in Shirashirim, chapter four, verse eleven, 
that there's an appellation brought between the Torah and milk and honey. We know as well, it's about Chalav the Vash, um, is um, a, ma- a land flowing with, with milk and honey, is, is also a term that we give to Eretz Yisrael. Zvat Chalav the Vash, the last letter spell Shabbat. And if anyone's seen that one, it's a, it's a nice drasha there. But it's seemingly that the idea of, of Chalav and the Vash is also an appellation given to the Torah as well. We know that in terms of the Jewish people, Shabbat and Torah, very often there's a link between them all. We, we cross-reference each other many times in terms of our drosha that we use. So it's another interesting thing that some people have the custom to eat honey as well. The Zohar of Kodesh brings an idea that the seven weeks between Pesach and Shavuot are, so to speak, ki'ilu, the Shiva Nikaim, the, the seven clean days that a wife waits before returning to her husband. Now, what's incredible about that is that as we go through these, these weeks, which are like days, we count the Omer and we also work on ourselves ethically. We read Perke Avot, we study works of Musa, we, we read about what sphere the Omer connects to in, in, a, in a bid, in an attempt to, to mitaken ourselves, to make ourselves better people. The, from the time between Pesach to the time of Shavuot, we want to be better people. And people take on extra learning, and people take on to do extra sadaqah, and people do all sorts of things in this time of the Omer. Some people uh, have additional restrictions. They don't listen to music, or they don't go to parties. Or there's lots of things people do at this time that, that propels them towards holiness, we hope. But in general, you can see that this is, a, in, in many ways, part of the purif- purification process that is, so to speak, the way the Jewish people were, um, were purified from the, from the Avodah Zarah of Mitzrayim, going towards the Makabelet of the Torah, when they came to receive the Torah, they went through this period of waiting, a bit like a husband and wife go through this period of purification. Another interesting idea which is brought there is that um, we know that a, a woman who's nursing, in general, does not have uh, the need as much to go to mikvah, because when a woman is, is nursing, because of the incredible design of a Kodesh Baruch Hu, women don't have, as, as often in general, a, a flow within this time. And so when, when a, w- a wife or a, w- a woman is nursing, so to speak, that element of purity is maintained and that's another appellation perhaps that now we're in a state of purity with Hashem eating halav. I heard from a rabbi of mine, Rabbi uh, Akiva Tatz, who is an incredible doctor and a bit of a Kabbalist and a, and a philosopher and also a, was a halachist. He's, he's an amazing person and he explained to me that what is milk? What is it? Well really it's blood the mammary glands convert the, the blood and the nutrients that the, that the woman eats into the milk. So, so to speak, that is al pidrasha, what we are trying to do. We have basavadam, we are, we are, we're flesh and blood, and we're trying to convert ourselves into something that is like halav and vash. We want to be sweeter, more like halav, and we can, so to speak, choose between an animalistic existence, which is in various different metaphorical statements of the Torah, exposed to blood, and we know that blood is associated with warfare and with all sorts of other appellations in the Torah, whereas milk is this purified version of blood that's so pure you could even give it to a baby. And we ourselves, we are forbidden to drink blood, but it happens to be we're also potentially forbidden to drink breast milk as well. That's a whole subject in of itself, another another fascinating uh, diversion off topic but it happens to be that human milk is parva and that there's many other interesting things that we could speak about in terms of that but that seems to be the the way that the Zohar Kodesh explains this appellation bef- between the milk and these seven days in the Kiyam. I would I accept that it, many times it is, it is very high level drashot that need that need thought um, and obviously working on a metaphorical sense I think that it makes sense just while we're here to accept that one of the interesting that comes up, as I mentioned, is that some of the some of the people felt that there is a bit of an intrinsic issue with having a halavi meal 
on Shavuot, one of the problems is that we ourselves have a halacha that's, that's formulated for us in terms of the Shulchan Aruch um, in 89b, that we wait between hard cheeses to meet. In the Talmud, in, in Chulon, in um, 105a, we actually see that uh, perhaps it's not, it's not necessarily so clear. We also see the famous Ma Ukba stringency of his father, who used to wait 24 hours between meat and milk, uh, whereas we ourselves only wait Shulchan to Shulchan, which is an allotted time. That being said, it turns out that if we read straight from the Shulchan it says, Ochel Gavina Mutala Ho Achrav Basami Yad. One is able to, to eat uh, cheese um, immediately, uh, and immediately one can eat meat. However, what we see there is in the, in the glosses there uh, of the Ramah is that there's basically the Machmirim, people who are strict, if they're eating hard cheeses, if they have pieces of cheese in their mouth, things like that, that they should be they should be machim and they should wait like they wait between meat uh, to milk and he he concludes that Simon how good it is to be to be strict in terms of especially with hard cheeses waiting from that so several different achronim uh, had the fear that perhaps eating the milk meal on Shavuot could end up with people eating meat afterwards and things like that many communities have a custom to eat some meals. Uh, milky and some meals milk uh, meaty and there's a bit of an argument as, as, as to whether or not it should be the night meal should be milky or it should be the day meal which is milky or, or bussery soft or soft i would suggest that these things are only um only minhag oriented it doesn't really matter for all intensive purposes which one is chosen to be a milky suda and for those people who are deciding that actually that they won't only want to eat meat and uh, and to have a normal suda they have what to rely on and for those people who are saying, I, well, it's an established custom that we have milk on, on Shavuot, they also have a, a lot to rely on in terms of many drashot and many, many customs. One of the nice ways, perhaps, to sum up the subject is that on the other festivals, whether that be Pesach, whether that be Sukkot, Yom Kippur, even the rabbinical festivals, Purim, Hanukkah, it's very clear what we have to do. It's very clear. There's a specific mitzvah that we have to do. We come to a place and we do it. We light the Hanukkah, we blow the shofar, we do the, we do the tanit, we do the fasting of Yom Kippur. Teshuvah really being the Ikka mitzvah that we're engaged with on Yom Kippur. We build the sukkah, we eat the matzah. One of the things that's interesting is the Torah, it's not something that's immediately clear what you have to do with it. When somebody gets interested in Judaism, we've had the privilege of working with, with Gerim in Jerusalem for many years, and also people from India, people in, in the Philippines. So, okay, I, I want to be Jewish. Okay, how does the Torah work? What, what do I do? Well, you know, first of all, you should know that there's a chiyuv to read the Pasha twice. And not just read the Pasha twice, but also with a commentary like Rashi and maybe even with a Targum. Okay, very good. But what about Mishnah, Talmud, Midrash, Kabbalah? There's, what about Musa? What about the hundreds of other sub-subjects that we deal with in terms of Torah? What, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to learn? What do, and that really is the key, I would suggest, to the whole conversation, is that the delving into the Torah is a journey that you undertake. And that is why no two hachamim, no two tamadeh hachamim see the Torah the same way. They don't learn the sugyas in the same way. They don't necessarily come to the same conclusions when they learn those sugyas. As we move right now into the Midbar, Pasha Midbar, and the Jews begin wandering through the desert, they start to have to forge their own path, just like we have to forge our own path through the Torah. I have given a marshal many times, but I think it's appropriate perhaps to finish with this marshal. You can't get fit and healthy by watching other people at the gym. You can't even imagine, you stand there every day like this, 
Well, he's really moving those weights around. Oh, yeah. You can't fix your marriage by sort of standing in the corner of the room and say, oh, she's really angry with me now. You know, the, you can't do that. You, you want your business to succeed. If you, if you climb in a cardboard box and pretend to be Schrodinger's cat, your business will not, su not succeed. For us as Jews, if we want to have spiritual success, we have to engage in the Torah. If we want to understand what the Torah means to us, why it's important, why it's a joy to open a sefer and to, and, to, and to read and to study, no rabbi can do it for us. No one else can achieve it for us on an individual level. And that's perhaps why there's this ambiguity on Shavuot. What is it? What is the Torah? And what does it mean to me? Is it, oh, okay, it's Cheesecake Day. It's, in, it's, it's Israeli National Cheesecake Day. What a shame. If, that, if that's all it is, if it's National Cheesecake Day. That's, that's something for other nations. For us, it's a chance to discover the inspirational material that has shaped our des destiny as a nation for thousands of years. Jews have given up their lives to study the pages of the books around us that we take for granted. Jews have learnt Torah under the most extreme circumstances and conditions in the world. Under empires that forbid, it, forbid its study, under tsars and kings that burnt books publicly and, and tried to convert us. If our reason for not studying Torah is I don't, I don't feel like it today. If that's where we're at as a people today, we really have to blame ourselves. I don't want to, to end the shir on, you know, tochacha and, and harshness. But the main reason people don't learn Torah is because they don't know what a joy it is to open a sefer and to find a subject that engages our intention and to study it. And we discover that there's hundreds of subjects. There's Mishnah, whether it's, whether it's the discussions of the Halakha, whether it's the Shachavatari of the Talmud, whether it's the metaphysics of the Kabbalah, whether it's the soul-searching of Musa, whether it's the sometimes brilliance of, of weaving different subjects together that you find in Hasidut. There's so many subjects and so many forum are available to us today online, for free, in the language that we choose. On Shavuot, we begin not a national cheesecake day, but a national recommitment and reaffirmation to our favorite national pastime, which is the study and the teaching and the learning of the Holy Torah. I hope that for everyone, this Shavuot will be filled with a lot of success to come in the whole year. I can guarantee you that if you take on to do a Perech of Tanakh a day, you'll complete it in about three years. If you do a couple of Mishnahs a day, you'll complete it in six years. If you do a Daf of Talmud a day, approximately seven years, you'll complete the whole Talmud. If you choose to undertake daily learning in your lives today, next Shavuot will feel like a Simchat Torah. Because you will have all of the joy of the Torah that you've been learning throughout the year. It's a time to rethink our role as individuals with the Torah and to realize that it's not just for the Bnei Yeshiva or the From From Birth or the Kolalech or the Rosh Hashim. Learning Torah is a privilege and a blessing that can be found for every Jew at every time, everywhere. And I hope everyone will have a beautiful Shavuot. We'll be here learning in Mitzvah Shem, and not only that, we'll have success. Mitzvah Shem. Thank you.